Good evening and welcome to Legacy After the Locker Room. I'm your host, Caleb Bradham, here tonight with NFL alumni, Judd Collins, joining you from the Classic Car Club in Manhattan, New York, where I'm blessed to be able to attend the Up to Us Sports Gala. Judd, thank you for joining the show, and I apologize if we get background noise as we tape this. Oh, we've learned anything over the last few years. You got to be able to play through virtually, in person, whatever it is, so... Uh, No, I appreciate the opportunity to share the message, and uh, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So, Judd, let's start from the beginning. You have uh, signed with a lot of NFL teams, (laughs) a lot, and that's part of the story. Where did this start as a child? What sports did you play growing up? I grew up uh, in a basketball household. So my both my brothers, uh, I'm one of five. So I'm the fourth of five, oldest daughter, youngest daughter, and then three boys intermixed there. My father was a big basketball player. He actually played at Seattle University back when they were pretty uh, pretty comparable and pretty dominant uh, for some, some years. And we grew up playing in the backyard. Sports was a focus, but it was more of a discipline. Um, we were very academic in, to begin playing into that student athlete, but we never even touched a football, never saw a football game. Uh, the first NFL game I ever went to, I played in. And as I looked at, you know, kind of growing up in the backyard, my dad invented a game called King for a Day. And if you ever want to establish competitive spirit within your children or young boys, this is kind of how you do it. So he would play a round robin of one-on-one basketball between the three. And we have a year uh, separating either of us. So I'm the youngest of the three, but only two years younger. And so we were pretty competitive. I at least like to think so. What I learned on that court growing up in the backyard was really how to lose. My oldest brother, Lenny, I would say won about 60% of the games. The middle brother, Jake, won about 30%. And I won a few, a handful. I vividly remember the few games I won, but that King for a Day experience really showed me not just the discipline of doing work, but also how to control my mindset, my my appreciation and my approach to losing, to failure. It taught me from an early age that there were going to be things about the outcome that I never was going to be able to control. I wasn't going to be better than my older brothers at basketball at phases and times in my life. Did I end up becoming the best? I think so, because I was able to deal with the loss. I was able to deal with a a setback in a season, in a game, in a moment, and overcome it. And so as I look at kind of what sports around my childhood and my youth was, it was a mainstay. It was a focal point. Uh, Now I have two little girls, and I'm trying to balance how competitive as a dad I want to be And as one of them's in third grade and asked me about playing sports, I said, we were winning championships in second grade. Uh, That was not by happen chance. That was because Papa Mike, you know, drilled us and made us uh, wake up and go outside. So King for a Day was a massive piece. And as we talked, you mentioned the, the 12 NFL teams. I would not have been able to deal with that kind of failure, rejection and disappointment if it had not been for those King of the Days in the, the backyard. So, so like I said, Jed, it's loud here. People are cheering. They're having a good time. People are cheering. I love it. It's all for kids and sports and great coaches. But I got to ask you, you went to a pretty illustrious college, and, and I think you're teaching at that same school, right? What Absolutely. did that college selection look like? Uh, so it came down to who was going to offer me an athletic scholarship, honestly. Um I was a prestigious linebacker coming out of high school, playing at Mission Viejo, was arguably, you know, the the best teams I got to be a part of. We went 41 games in a row. Um, I got to play for a high school legend, Bob Johnson, who absolutely changed my life and the life of many young men. And so getting to go to Washington State, I committed uh, almost immediately after the Cougars beat uh, the Texas Longhorns in the Holiday Bowl and was in, in, in excitement. Um, the excitement was not just for the football. It was more for the cultural shock, more for the experience. I grew up in Orange County, California, and to go to Pullman, Washington isn't the other side of the world, but it's, it's pretty close. It has uh, very little 
familiarity or similarities to Orange County. Um, and so the excitement to go to Pullman, play at a game that I was learning to love and appreciate and get the opportunity to have an education uh, was kind of one of those things that I couldn't pass up. But again, even in Pullman at Washington State, coming in as a linebacker, I was quickly, you know, kind of shut the door on, told linebacker was never going to be something that I got to go do because I wasn't fast enough, something that plagued my entire career and, you know, was one of those items that I kept saying, well, look at the film, not the, you know, not the 40-yard dash. Um, and so as I was there, I had to transition positions a few times kind of settling on the idea and the mindset of just how do I add value to the team? How do I get onto the field? And going to Pullman, going to Washington State was a fulfilling, enjoyable four years. I got to experience a great time on the field. Wish we would have got some more wins out there. Got to meet my wife and my lovely bride who's been with me for the last 13, 14 years. Um, and really just looking at kind of what that college atmosphere and experience is meant to be. I truly measure and weigh a college scholarship. We put so much time and effort into getting our kids in this next generation of youth scholarships and thinking the payout is gonna be in the sport. Payout is gonna be that they're gonna go become professional athletes. And the reality is the value of a college scholarship today has a lot more to do with the network and the connection to the university beyond the campus than any moment or time that you spent on the campus. So. I'm proud to look at Washington State today. I'm a member of an organization called Kooks First and truly just looking and, and actually I'm now going full circle. As you mentioned, I've been an adjunct professor of personal finance at Washington State. And oddly enough, now I am leading up the NIL movement for the Cougar Collective and helping us support our athletes on campus. Well, Jed, I absolutely love that. We're doing, we're doing our best to do the same thing with NIL for good. It's really important. It's long overdue giving these college athletes the opportunity to take control of their name, image, and likeness. So I want to say thank you. Do me a favor, Jed. You mentioned it, so I know I'm not stealing your thunder. 12 NFL teams. For anybody who doesn't know that story, will you walk us through what that looks like and some of the feelings that come with that? Absolutely. So I'd like to say, you know, after the, the first, you know, two or three, you get kind of used to it. But truly, every call, every moment, every time I walked in and it was my heart being ripped out of my chest, my dream being over and never really knowing if I was going to get to put on a helmet again or have an opportunity to play again. Um, it was humbling. It was humbling because, you know, as a, as a young man, your ego tells you you can, and enough people start to tell you you can't, you start to question yourself. You start to question a lot of things. Um, I would compare it to being an entrepreneur, and that's something I'm doing today, but being told no time and time again and still finding the ability to believe in yourself, believe in your vision, believe in what you're doing, and believing in the process, believing that you're putting in the time and the work. Um, I was extremely fortunate to have some, you know, fluke opportunities arrive. You know, I, my third season, the only reason I got to keep playing was a, a young fullback broke his back. And I got to come into a camp in the Tennessee Titans and start to earn a position. What well, didn't end up being for that team, but I got to show enough that the New Orleans Saints called me. But what I challenged myself, looking at those 12 teams, I challenged myself in what my biggest takeaway from the game of football was going to be. Experiencing the NFL, I knew I was never going to be a 10, 20, 30 million dollar player. So I asked, well, in five years, 10 years, 25 years, what am I going to remember and what am I going to take away? And I think I got every bit of the NFL dream because I woke up to the financial realities and started to educate myself there, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, but really focusing on the habits of greatness, the habits of success, walking into 12 teams, looking around and seeing the guys, you know, some of which I grew up watching, um, you know, again, at friends' houses, because I didn't have TV, anything like that, but looking at these, these men and saying they are the best in the world, they are the best in the world. And then I kept getting cut and being told to go home. And so I started to ask myself, what were they doing that I wasn't doing? 
what were those those little things, big things, mindset, practices, uh, everything, studying? How were they sticking around? And I wasn't able to do that. And so I started to walk out of each each locker room. Every time I got cut, I forced myself in my journal that day, that night, to start to write about the players I was around. Write about a 15-year linebacker, a 12-year you know, offensive lineman, a 13-year safety, a 20-year kicker, a 17-year long snapper. Who were these men and what were they doing? And I think that as I look back on my career, those are the gifts, the the unspoken code, the kind of uh, you know series of events that I got to steal from the greats and steal from the best in the world. And really walked away with a, a tool belt full of habits, a tool belt full of behaviors that I have seen firsthand evolve into greatness. And if I can be in the same room or breath of greatness, you're in a place you want to be. And it's a place you'll never get rid of in your head and in your heart. The curse of greatness is very real. Look at any athlete who's experienced it. They chase it. They chase it and chase it and chase it. But what I really came to understand, and I call them rookie to veteran, I have 10 different mindsets, 10 different habits in that rookie to veteran sequence was the 10th one was how much the greats, the difference between the goods and the greats, the greats started to enjoy the hunt. They enjoyed the process. They liked the idea. I remember Drew Brees telling me one day he loved every day getting to work before the sun came up. It just it started him out making him feel productive. And so me being the young no-name guy, I started trying to beat Drew in the building. Didn't get to do that very often because he's a habitual man. But looking at these ideas and these concepts, I was failing. And at the same time, those were the best gifts. If I would have gone and played two or three years on my first team and then got cut, I would have never been the man I am today. I would never have started my own business and become an entrepreneur. But now I look at it and I see the, the blessings. But Steve Jobs said it best. He said, the dots always connect backwards. At the moment, I thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. And now as I look back on it, my career was perfectly poetically fit for who I am and who I was. Wow. And, and it's almost like a fairy tale because for a guy who got signed with 12 different teams, that beautiful ending to that diligence and that hard work was really turning around the Saints' numbers. You ended up, I believe, I remember the number one fullback, right? Absolutely. That's what uh, you know. I I got to look at. Um, again, it took four years. It took a lot of getting cut, a lot of told no, a lot of headaches. But I started to measure it. And one of the greatest, you know, pieces of the rookie to veteran sequence is what football is known as is a game of inches. And a veteran started to tell me that every day he walked in the building, he tried to steal an inch, whether that was in the weight room, the film room, the practice field, the cafeteria, everywhere he tried to steal an inch. And I took that to heart and I started to practice that Monday through Saturday. If I can steal an inch a day it would add up to six inches. And it just so happens that a fullback's measurement of success is a six inch battle. Going into a collision, if I can move the other opponent back six, six inches, I mean, it's the NFL, you're not gonna decleat and knock people over every play. So if I can get a good leverage and a good pop and I can move them back that six inches, I had to steal that throughout the week. And so I'd go into Sunday with those six inches already stolen, ready to measure. And as you mentioned, you know, 2011, I was the best in the in the world at what I was doing as a lead blocking fullback. Nobody else was doing it better than I was at that moment in time and that moment in place. And it was every bit earned, every bit deserved. But it was through that mindset of taking it inch by inch, day by day and seeing how I can climb the mountain. And, you know, those are those lessons. Those are those things sports teach us that nothing else is really going to teach you. Um and I look at it and I, again, I, I attribute the success I had and the tr success we're having today uh, to is not just establishing those, those habits, but to believing in them. Because there's always going to be times and moments where you question it and you look in a mirror or you look at it in a dark room and want to turn away, want to quit, want to cry. Um, but it's having that focus of, hey, all I can do tomorrow is wake up and steal that inch. 
that's a, a beautiful way to start a Tuesday. So, Jed, at some point, the NFL career ends for everyone, and it's time to hang up those cleats and move forward. You had spent a lot of time being diligent, like you said, writing in your journal. Go ahead, if you don't mind, and start working us back from the, from the time that your career ends. How did you decide what you wanted to do with the next steps? A, a beautiful c curse, if you will, or kind of a silver lining to getting cut so much. I was preparing. I knew my journey was going to end very quickly. It had ended 10 times before. So I knew the game of football was going to stop. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing because I was looking at what is next. I was kind of thrust upon or forced into the journey I went down because of fear. Now, the game of football is going to take a lot from you physically, mentally, emotionally, but I wanted to look at the game and be able to say how much I took from it. And money in the world of professional sports in the NFL is a big, big piece of that. I had a great coach, Joe Vitt, tell us that you leave this game, game of football, with a bag of M&Ms, some memories and some money. And unfortunately, enough guys aren't leaving with that other half of that bag. They're not leaving with the money they need. But my rookie year, I was just like everyone else. I got my paycheck. I spent it the day I got it. I was financially illiterate. My story is I did end up buying it or my first paycheck. I bought a, an engagement ring. And so it was a wise investment. And I get told that. And I remember that. But at the same time, it was a very poor financial habit. Making your paycheck, spending your paycheck is no way to go through or really capture the NFL dream. And so as I was going through my journey, I woke up to that reality that nobody had ever spoken to me or talked to me about money. It was a scary thought looking at it and saying, I know physically what this is going to take. I don't know financially what I'm supposed to do to take from it back. And so I set out, started to you know walk board, Borders bookstores, Barnes and Nobles, and just go down that personal finance aisle. Look at the gurus, the Dave Ramseys, the, the Robert Kiyosaki's, the Jim Cramers, the Susie Ormans, start to get their books, actually sit in Barnes and Noble and just scour through books again out of fear, but as my first student. I started to train and teach myself the language of money. And as my knowledge and, and interest grew, I actually started for, and you can see behind my name, studying for that certification in financial planning each off season through the NFL. So seven years, every off season, after about my third year, I started st taking those certification and financial planning exams, making a useful time of my off season, which you get plenty of time in the off season. Everybody should be doing something productive. But as that idea grew, as people started to notice, wow, Jed's learning the language of money. Let's go ask him questions. That came in the locker room at first from players and other people talking about the four NFL 401k or life insurance or different items and topics. And then my brothers who are beat me up in basketball growing up, but very highly educated started asking me questions. And then other people started asking me questions. And I started to realize even my, you know, my mother and my father, love them to death, both very financially illiterate. Obviously, they never spoken or taught to their children about it. Not really a fault of their own, just was not a, a piece or a conversation point in their households growing up. And so why did would it transition into ours? And so on that journey, I started becoming that CFP and I really started to understand I liked having an answer or having a guidance for people in this world. I liked being able to direct them, to educate them, not make the decision for them, but kind of give them both sides of a coin and at least explain to them what the decision that they were about to make is. And so that's where my journey led. I, I kept studying. I kept getting better at it. Again, I went from my first student to becoming the teacher of sorts. I went to high schools and colleges, community colleges, nonprofits, and just started teaching, standing in front of a room and trying to teach everybody everything about money you can in, in 30 minutes or less. Um, I actually just got off with uh, the LSU women's basketball team, teaching them about money. And as that journey and experience grew, I, I realized my passion. Once the game of football was done, I went in, became a wealth management, was a financial advisor, 
But I, I woke up one day and I just said, this is not my passion. This is not what I love. It's a great career. It's a much better income. I will say that. But I knew in 5, 10, 15 years, I was going to wake up and kind of be lost or kind of be wanting. And so that's really where I got the courage to jump, you know, start building a plane as it was flying in the air and become an entrepreneur and say, where is that class they should have in high school and why isn't it being taught? And so I set out to try to begin to build that. And that's what Money Vehicle started and has become. And Judd, you've you've actually, I think, written a book about that. You're teaching, you're working with NIL, you're helping college kids understand this. Tell us a little bit about like the full gamut of everything this includes, because I think people see you and they say, oh, he's just probably working with rich NFL and NBA guys. That's not true. You're making a difference, creating hope and possibility, right? Absolutely. So it, it began uh, with a book. It began, honestly, taking the bus to and from work when I was working in wealth management. I started to try to think of little stories and analogies how can we take the complex and simplify it to where everybody would understand it? Build little silly stories, be a character and understand that everybody in finance is so serious and so straightforward. How can we get silly and kind of entertaining with it? And so all of those analogies is what Money Vehicle is built on and what other content creators, other advisors and people have helped the program and the company build are how do we translate, translate the language? I am, could not be more proud to work with NFL teams, to work with colleges and athletic departments. But what I'm most proud of today is that Money Vehicle is being utilized on high school campuses in 11, depending on when this, you know, when people watch us, we're just starting to venture into our 12th and 13th states across the country. High school campuses in 11 plus states across the United States. That is what we are. We are a turnkey financial literacy course for a hybrid experience in a, in a classroom. How do we empower the teacher? How do we give them the support and knowledge and expertise to go in and share on a subject that they're not always an expert in? And how do we then entertain the student to say, we know this is a subject. We know this is one that has been stale and old in the past. But here's a new take on it. Here's a new story. Here's a new approach. How are we going to stimulate and entertain you and put you into a situation where you now take the knowledge that you've learned and begin to apply it for yourself? What is one of the neat facets about what we're doing, because I'm a journaler and because I love to write, we've created something called an owner's man manual. So the book or the book started as Your Money Vehicle. The company is just simply Money Vehicle. And as we play into that analogy, every chapter you go through builds another piece to this theoretical money vehicle. And so we give them an owner's manual that goes along with their vehicle. And as you go through the program, you're filling out this owner's manual throughout the program. And by the end of it, you have started a financial plan. Our mission is to close the financial literacy gap, but it is to empower students to take action. Education without action is meaningless. And so with that owner's manual, we not just document their journey, but we document and show them how to take those actions, the first 10 steps in a financial plan. And as we look at the growth and now with states mandating, states are mandating and saying, you need to go have a class that looks oddly similar to money vehicle. It doesn't have to be money vehicle. There's other good ones out there. And I think we're the best, but looking at it and saying, 15 states are requiring this course that we were in dire need of. I was hope, I wish I would have had money vehicles now supplying and providing that. And that's when we look at the business. I love working with students. I love what we're getting to do. But the business of money vehicle and why it can become a nationwide company is because we are providing and empowering not just the students, but the teachers on high school campuses. And that is something that has been a 14 year vision now, truly come to fruition and come to life. So Judd, I, I wanna give you 
a, a minute or two to drop some golden nuggets, especially when it comes to our NIL athletes, because this is what everybody is talking about right now. And it was my biggest concern when NIL became a thing. I was like, wait, these kids don't know tax law. Their parents don't need, don't know tax law. Nobody's looking out for the kids. I see a lot of sharks. I was at the influencer summit, seeing people offer uh, influencers with a million followers, $250 worth of pizza a month, signing over their name, image, and likeness for perpetuity, right? And it was just yep. like, I just wanted to like poke their eyes out because you can see right through that. So I want to give you a minute to drop some golden nuggets. Before I do, I just want to shout out Sports Philanthropy Network for powering this podcast. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. Jed, go ahead and drop those nuggets for the NIL college kids. Well, what's beautiful is a paycheck's a paycheck's a paycheck. And I talk to plenty of 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, and 55-year-olds, all with the same questions. And so what I like to do is begin with our money bucket system. So you have five choices with every paycheck that you're ever going to get. Jeff Bezos, wealthiest people in the world, same five choices. And this is what we really need to start and challenge ourselves. You can kind of play checkers with your money. Or you can build a strategy and start to play chess and start to maneuver and strategize and create an opportunity to make choices before the paycheck even arrives. So when you look at those five choices, you begin with society. We change it from taxes to society because we want to see the impact of where your money is going. Society depends on our tax system, but we got to put a quarter a quarter of every paycheck into that society choice. Now, I do work with professional athletes who make a lot more money. They work all the way up to about 40 plus percent in that society choice. But for the average college student who is starting out in the first year of their career or making NIL dollars, 50 to $100,000, you're going to be in that quarter bracket. So 25% goes into that society choice. Then we identify our past choices. This is an easy one if you understand the concept. A past choice is anything you've already bought or paid for before the month begins. We're in October. When you look at November, you've already spent money in November, even though you're still in October. Your rent, your debts, your bills, your subscriptions, which is our generation's kind of Achilles heel because people don't want to buy, but they'll rent it for a long time. Looking at those choices, that is a number you need to identify. I know going into November, I am spent already $1,200 or $2,000 or $10,000. What are your past choices? That's going to be a big ticket item. That's going to be about 34% of that paycheck. So 25 to society, 34 goes into those past choices. Then we go from the past to the present. These are your daily spends. Sure, it's walking around, your wants, the fun. This is where you get to enjoy money, and money is a gift. You should enjoy it, and with a system, you can enjoy it. So that is going to be where we start to look at about 30%, 25%, 34%, 30%. Then we come to past, present, future. What is that future choice? If anyone ever wants to have FU money, you got to begin with future you. Looking at this, one of the greatest personal finance sayings in the world, I made a dollar, I saved a dime. I made a dollar, I saved a dime. That means 10% of every paycheck is going to future me. That begins with savings. We call it the Corona cushion. It used to be known as the emergency fund. Beginning to save and protect your burn rate or your past and your present choices looking at those dollars and identifying exactly what you need to live on for two, three, four, five months. That cushion gives your time the money it is going to need to work for you when you venture into investing. Big difference between investing and saving. Saving protects you from risk. Investing produces risk. The last 1% is going to go to your compassion choice, and this is to begin a habit. Compassion means it's going to someone, someplace, or something outside of myself. That could be a gift for Christmas or a birthday present. It could go to a sports philanthropy group. It could go to the church down the street. It could go wherever you want outside of yourself. So as you identify these choices, every paycheck you get, 
25% goes to society. 34% is in my past choices. My present is what I live on. My future is 10%, if not more. But then I get to decide, what do I want? I want to put 15% in my present, or excuse me, my future. Where am I taking it from? That is your choice. That's how you customize and personalize those money buckets. But if we can look at students today and get them to not only set up a cash management system, but automate it in the accounts that they are going to need to be successful, they will be worlds ahead of any of us, and they will be on the path to financial freedom, which is our ultimate goal. You know, Jeff, I, I couldn't, uh, Jed, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you're right on target. It's really about making wise choices to be able to live generously. So I really appreciate that. I want to go ahead and pop this up on the screen if you're watching the broadcast. If you're not watching it and maybe you're listening on your way to work tomorrow or while you wash the dishes, find Jed on LinkedIn. It's Jedediah, parentheses, Jed Collins, CFP. Find him on LinkedIn, connect, ask him, hey, Jed, is this in my state? Jed, you can let people know, right? Is this in my state? Absolutely. If it's not in, if it's not in your state, you probably want to be going to your school administration and saying, hey, I was watching a podcast. I saw Jed Collins. It sounded like he had some solid ideas. How do I get this into our school? Jed, if people want to learn more about Money Vehicle, if they want to bring it into the schools, if they want to purchase the book, how are they going to do those things? So check us out at yourmoneyvehicle.com. I uh, would love to send you more information. You can reach out at info at yourmoneyvehicle.com via email. If you are interested, we have plenty of supporters who say, we need this in my high school or a high school near us. A parent, a financial advisor, a community advocate wants to pay for, support, and provide it. We have plenty of those opportunities. In the states that are mandating it, would love to be introduced to anyone. But even in the states that aren't, teachers are begging for this content, begging for this course and curriculum because they see the vitality of it and they see the need. So reach out to us, find us, uh, yourmoneyvehicle.com, and would welcome any questions and opportunities to connect to your high schools. Jed, I, I want to say thank you. This is a really important subject. It starts in high school. It carries over to college, but all of us know it affects us for the rest of our lives. I can't tell you how many divorces I've seen over money. Mm -hmm. Can't tell you how much destruction I've seen over money. And frankly, you know this as well as I do. I can't tell you how many professional athlete alumni I know that are living either in their cars or in a two bedroom house driving an Acura because nobody taught them when they were playing pros how to save that money for later and, and how to grow their money. So thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do, folks. My name is Kayla Bradham host of Legacy After the Locker Room here tonight with NFL alumni, Jed Collins, reminding you to live your legacy. Thanks, Jed. Thank you.